Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church's virtual worship service this week. We thank you for joining us. Today is the first Sunday of the month and so we are celebrating communion as a congregation. If you're uh, worshiping with us in this video from your home, please feel free to uh, gather some bread or juice or wine of some sort uh, to celebrate communion with us. In our Presbyterian tradition, you don't have to be a member of our congregation or a Presbyterian to participate in the Lord's Supper. The Lord has prepared this feast for all of us who believe and trust in him. So again, welcome. Let us give thanks to God for worship this week, this day. Let us give thanks to God for all that God does in our lives, for all that we praise him for. Let us worship God. Uh, we begin our worship with a prayer of adoration as well as a prayer that asks God to open us to the words of God in this time of, of worship. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in your baptism you called us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us courage like you gave the, the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And now open us to words of Scripture read, to proclamation of those words, to the Spirit through whom the reading and proclamation give voice to you, our God and our Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we have been uh, going through the I Am sayings of Jesus, and for the first few weeks we have spent um, our time in John's Gospel. Um, the next few weeks we'll spend our time in John's Gospel as well, but this week we're taking a, a break from John's Gospel to move over, the, over to Matthew's Gospel, uh, to, one of the I, to the I Am saying that we find there. Later we'll hear from uh, the voice of Christ in the Revelation to John. Uh, but today we hear from, in Matthew, from Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Let us listen for a word from God. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of these words. Let us pray. And now God, our rock and our redeemer, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. Amen. The I am saying here is in the version I read, I am gentle and humble in heart. In some more traditional English versions, it is I am meek and lowly of heart. So first of all, uh, we've got to deal with that idea of meekness, of Jesus being meek. That's how Leslie Weatherhead, whose book over his own signature, I'm using to guide me through these I am sayings of Jesus. That's how he starts his conversation about this text with that idea of meekness. He says we need to get something out of the way about that. It doesn't mean probably what we think it means in English because you see, I think a lot of us, when we hear the term meek, we associate it almost immediately with a, a, a word that rhymes with meek and that is weak. We tend to think of meekness as weakness. One of the first people I think of in that context is from uh, my teenage years, a movie called Back to the Future. If you've seen it, uh, it the word meek or weak reminds me of Marty's dad, who is a doormat. 
He is constantly being uh, pushed around by the school bully Biff. He's constantly being uh, tortured and, and, and picked on, and he can't seem to bear any burden for himself. He seems powerless in the midst of his burdens. He's weak. We might say he's meek. But that's not what Jesus means when he uses this word. The word that he uses in, in the language he spoke was not what we think of as weak, says Weatherhead. It's something a little different. In order to sort of point out what this word means in its original context and language, Weatherhead uses the example of the night that Albert Schweitzer came to visit Weatherhead's home for dinner. You may have heard of Albert Schweitzer. In post-World War Europe, he was very well known, very famous for many different reasons. Um, he was a great scholar in many different areas. Weatherhead tells the story of the night uh, Schweitzer came to his house, and he, he paints the picture of Albert Schweitzer sitting at their home piano with Weatherhead's little girl sitting on his lap and, and taking the little girl's hands and slowly helping her to to pound out a very simple musical tune. I don't know if it was Mary Had a Little Lamb or Chopsticks or what, but, but he was just taking such delight in her delight. And Weatherhead said, you got to re realize that this is a man who was at the time the greatest living scholar and expert on box music. And he, like a nanny, was taking great delight in playing a simple child's tune with that little girl. He said the whole night was like that. At dinner, you know, Schweitzer had more knowledge than all the other people in the dinner combined probably. But he said at dinner, it was you wouldn't have known it because Schweitzer took much more delight in listening to what other people had to say than he took in hearing his own voice. Weatherhead says, here was the greatest exponent of box music that was living, the, a great philosopher, a great theologian. He was a Lutheran minister, and he was a world-famous missionary physician. All this knowledge, all this greatness about him. Yet, you wouldn't have known it. You see, it wasn't about him. He had a, a healthy ego in that he cared more about others than he cared about himself. He didn't need to let everybody know how smart he was. He didn't need to tell the world how great he was. He didn't need to try to say how much more right he was than everybody else and how everybody else was not nearly up to his capabilities. He didn't need to, to uh, blow his own horn, so to speak. He was very comfortable in who he was. He was, we might say, meek, humble, gentle, when I heard the story about Albert Schweitzer, I thought about a man I've known in my past um, in another church. He was a retired Navy admiral, had risen to the highest ranks of the U.S. Navy. He had done great things. He had accomplished more in half a lifetime than, than most of us will ever accomplish in all of our lifetimes. He was a great man, respected by a lot of other great men and women. A lot of other great people knew who he was, but if you'd known him in the context I knew him, and if you had not known about his Navy career, if you had not known about all of his past accomplishments, you wouldn't have known it. You might know, because you'd hear him talk about it, how he loved uh, tending to his orchids. You might know that he got up before dawn every Tuesday morning to come and cook eggs for the men of the church, and that he stayed afterwards to wash dishes, and even sometimes mop the floor. You might know that he was a participant in Bible studies where he, he spent a whole lot more time asking questions and listening to what other people he had, had to say than he spent telling you what he thought. You might know that he spent time as a Stevens minister, sitting and caring for people in the congregation who had experienced loss and mourning. You might know these things, but you wouldn't have known about the, the great admiral. You wouldn't have known about all those past accomplishments because, you see, he didn't need to tell you those things. He was, as we sometimes say today, comfortable in his own skin. He was comfortable with who he was and more concerned about caring for others and who you were than he was about telling you about himself. 
He was meek in the best sense of the word. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, now that we're not saying Jesus is a doormat, Jesus is weak and can't take care of himself, now that we know that's not what Jesus means in this passage, well, we need to ask, so why does Jesus say this? Why is this I am saying given to us when Jesus says, I am meek and lowly of heart, I am gentle and humble? Well, Weatherhead points out that it comes right in the middle of one of the most beloved passages of Scripture. We just read it. Come to me. All you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. I am meek. I am gentle. I am humble in heart. But of course, Weatherhead says, we've got to back up and say, why does Jesus say this? Why does he give these great words of hope and comfort to us when he does? And if we back up in Matthew's gospel, we find that Jesus has just been saying some things that we would never categorize as weak or meek or gentle. If we back up a few verses, we hear Jesus saying things like this. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. On the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for you than Tyre and Sidon, cities of the Gentiles. And woe to you, Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? No. You will be brought down to Hades. On the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for you than Sodom. Sodom, that city God destroyed by fire. Words of not meekness or gentleness for sure. Certainly these are words of judgment from Jesus' lips that had just been spoken. Weatherhead surmises, he guesses that perhaps after Jesus spoke these harsh words of judgment, maybe he looked around at the people who were listening and maybe he saw their raised eyebrows and maybe he saw their looks of concern and discomfort and perhaps because, as, a, as a response to those feelings of the crowds, perhaps that's when he decided to say these words of hope. Because Jesus immediately turns from words of ju harsh judgment to say, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You see, we have here in this extended passage, if we back up from the passage that we read a while ago, we have here in this extended passage two things that can never be separated in the Bible. Judgment and mercy. Judgment and mercy go hand in hand in Scripture. We cannot separate them. We'd like to. We often do, actually. I mean, you can go to some churches where all you hear is words of judgment. All you hear are words of hell, fire, and brimstone. And you can go to other churches where all you hear are words of forgiveness and mercy. And it doesn't matter what we do because God will forgive us. But in Scripture, these things are not separate. They always go together. We tend to think of the God of the Old Testament as the God of judgment and Jesus as the God of mercy. But the fact is, if we read our Bibles, that is completely false. Because the Jesus we meet is the same God we meet in the Old Testament. You see, we think of Jesus as only gentle, as only merciful, as only perhaps meek. But Jesus has many words of judgment. Listen to just some of the words Jesus speaks just in Matthew's gospel, the gospel we're reading from this morning. Jesus says in chapter 6, If you do not forgive others, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you of your sins. In chapter 18, Jesus says, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. These are words of Jesus. In chapter 23, Jesus says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? These are not gentle, um, easy words to hear. These are words of judgment unmistakable words of judgment from Jesus. These aren't from the Old Testament. 
These are words from Jesus. Now, Jesus' words of, of, of mercy we know in love. We know those by heart, perhaps. But Jesus' words of judgment we either ignore or they shock us because they are so unexpected. But judgment and mercy are two things that cannot be separated in Scripture. Woe to you, as Jesus says, is followed closely by come to me. Woe to you, come to me, cannot be separated. This shouldn't surprise us. We see this same uh, dynamic at work in the Old Testament that we do here. My favorite example is the prophet Hosea, chapter 11. God, through the prophet Hosea, has just pronounced some of the most thoroughgoing words of judgment in all of Scripture. God basically says, I'm done with you, Israel. I'm, I, I'm wiping my hands of you. I no longer have anything to do with you. You're going to call, I'm going to wipe you out. You're going to call on me, and I will not help you, not one little bit. We're through. And then in the very next verse, God says, I can't give you up. How can I let you go? My heart recoils. It breaks within me. I'm not a human being. I'm God. I cannot let you go. I will bring you back to me. Sound familiar? Woe to you. Come to me. Judgment. Mercy. They cannot be separated. Two things that cannot be separated. Even in this, even if we just took the words that we read, starting with come to me, all you who are weary and carry, even if we just took those words out of the scripture, even there, Jesus does not, uh, does not let go of judgment. He does not remove judgment, even from those words of mercy, because there remains the yoke. Take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke was or is. It's that wooden piece that, that fits over the back of a beast of burden so that they can be directed and, 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 and led in their work, in the task that they have to do. Sometimes a yoke joins two animals together. That's the image we have in this passage. In fact, the image we have in this passage is, a, is of a training yoke, scholars believe, where one beast, the older, the the, uh, the stronger beast would be tied to a younger, weaker beast, but obviously they can't bear the same burden, and so the yoke would put most of the burden on the stronger beast, and the other beast would be trained, led, to get stronger and to learn. That is, scholars think, the image that's being used here. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. I'll bear it with you. I'll bear the brunt of it. I will teach you. Learn from me. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Yes. Woe to you. Woe to anyone or anything that exists in contradiction to God's kingdom because those things cannot exist in God's kingdom. That kind of sin and brokenness, that kind of hatred and violence, None of that stuff, none of that evil can exist in God's kingdom. So yes, woe to anyone and anything that exists in contradiction to God's kingdom. Judgment and mercy. Woe to you and come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We turn now to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come, Scripture says, from east and west and north and south to sit at table in God's kingdom. According to Luke's gospel, 
when the risen Christ appeared to some of his followers on the road, they didn't recognize him. Their eyes were not open to who he was until he sat at table and broke bread with them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him as their risen Lord. May the same be true for us as we gather around this table. Whether we gather around it in, in, in person, in the sanctuary, on Sunday morning, or whether we gather around it virtually through this worship service. May the Holy Spirit open our eyes to the presence of the risen Christ, very real to us as we share this meal. Now, as I said before, in our tradition, you don't have to be a Presbyterian or a member of our congregation to share in this and participate in this meal. Our Lord invites all who believe and trust in him to share in this feast. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, who is with us, we lift our hearts to you to give you thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise because you have created all things and sustained them by your power. You created us in your image. You set us in the world to love and serve you, to live in peace with your whole creation. We, of course, rebelled, but you never turned away from us. You always called us back to yourself through your prophets. And then in the fullness of time and out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed people who were sick. He fed people who were hungry. He opened blind eyes. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners. And he proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. And so, remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and the contents of this cup, and we joyfully celebrate the dying and rising of Christ as we await the day of his coming. We ask God that you would sanctify these everyday elements, that you would set them apart for your holy purpose. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples and us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread and after he'd given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup in the same way and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. Let us pray. 
Holy God, we thank you you have fed us in the sacrament, that you have united us with Christ, that you've given us a taste of the kingdom meal we shall share in your presence. Take us now from this time of worship that we may serve you with grateful hearts, hearts of compassion and forgiveness, hearts of love for one another as we have been loved by you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and for your kingdom's sake. Amen. As we leave this time of worship, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.